Okay, then it's probably time to make a start. Now, within the way I scheduled the lectures when I wrote the course, we would be talking about piled foundations at this point. However, I realise from Wednesday's lecture there's just a few ideas I wish to finalise before we start talking about deep foundations. So, what I want to do first is just finish off um, shallow foundations, do the last example problem, and then we'll move on to piled foundations. Okay, so what I want to remind us all of is we're dealing with a material where we're saying the shear stress at failure is equal to, in the general case, C dash, although for very many soils, C dash will be very small, plus sigma dash tan phi. Or if the soil is undrained, we're dealing with an equation where tor at failure equals Cu. So that is drained behaviour. And this is undrained behaviour. Okay, I've sketched those quickly on the video table because I want to make sure the lecture capture has the same information in it. But just for the moment, we'll put them up here as well. Tor at failure equals C dash plus sigma dash tan phi or tor at failure equals Cu, our strength equations. And what we found was when we're considering the drained case, the bearing capacity equation looked like this. Oh. I meant to insert shape factors so we can consider square or circular or rectangular um, footing. So I'll put those in by hand. So we're talking about SC, SQ, and S gamma to allow us to correct for shape. And if it's a strip footing, we get a, a two-dimensional failure mechanism that looks like that. And when it's a square footing, we get or a circular footing, we get some sort of <coughs> three-dimensional equivalence. Okay, so how do I mentally justify those terms? Well, the first term, and of course when we're applying it to a drained equation, we're saying the drained strength equation is tor failure equals C dash plus sigma dash tan phi. The first term would be expressed in terms of C dash now. Sorry, did my writing, is it clear at the back or is it, do I need to change the pen colour? So fine, okay, I was going to say the third question was, do I need to turn the microphone on? Okay, so here we go. So the first term characterises the shear strength around that mechanism, which is derived from the drained cohesion. The second and third term characterise shear strength arising from friction. So around that mechanism there's shear strength arising from friction, what do we need to have a frictional resistance? We need to have a normal, effective stress. The second term, that term there, Q, and it can be expressed in effective stress terms if we've got a high water table, is the pressure that is applied at this level here. And by applying a pressure at that level there, we increase the normal stress around the mechanism. So you can think of the second term as being the strength 
which is derived from friction due to the surcharge pressure. The third term, well, a half gamma B, well, a half gamma B would be a depth about there, wouldn't it? A half B, I should say. A half B is about a depth of about there. Multiply by gamma, and you're starting to get a measure of the self-weight stress of the soil between foundation level. So as we go down with depth, obviously the self-weight stress builds up, and so there's extra friction on the failure surface due to self-weight. And you can think of, if this overall depth is related to B, a half gamma B is some sort of average, and I'm using that term extremely loosely, but it's a sort of average effective stress due to self-weight of the soil in the zone of failure. So that's how you can justify in a sort of descriptive way why we have those three terms. The first one is strength due to cohesion, and it's why it's the only significant term when we have an undrained failure. The second and third terms are the strength due to friction. Friction requires an effective stress normal to the failure plane, and that effective stress is created by a combination of the surcharge at that level and the self-weight of the soil. And that's why we get those two terms. So it's a way in which you can sort of rationalise the three terms of the equation. OK. I'm still in recap mode. I'm picking up on things which I felt I didn't make clear enough on Wednesday. I've been struggling with a, a nasty cold and my thinking's been a little bit fuzzy, but I realised on Wednesday that I didn't make a couple of things sufficiently clear. So this is why we're recapping Right, we talked about eccentric loads, and we said, how do we design footings to resist eccentric loads? Well, the first thing I said was, why on earth would any sensible engineer put the column off centre? And the answer is, of course an engineer wouldn't put the column off centre. However, a column applied centrally, if it applies a moment as well as a normal force, it's equivalent to an off-centre load. Why, if you know there's going to be a moment, wouldn't you adjust the footing so the load appears to be central? Well, the answer is we're dealing with lots of design scenarios. This is possibly the footing for a frame structure. We've got lots of columns, and in the design of that building, you're going to come up with different loading scenarios, particularly putting the live load in different locations to see which one gives you the worst moments. And so this might be just one loading scenario. The main loading scenario, the one you think really would be applicable most of the time, would of course be a century applied load. But during the other loading scenarios you've got to test, you might find there's an off-centre load due to moment being applied to the column. So you just want to quickly be able to check this and make sure that this hasn't changed the stability of your foundation. And so the two ways we can do it, well, you can ignore a bit of a footing. We know from experience that the bigger the footing is, the safer it is. It's what we do. If we find that a footing hasn't got enough bearing capacity, we make it wider. So knocking a bit of the footing off in our mind, you know, so effectively nobody's going to go out on site and actually cut it off, but if we think it has... This is a safe version of the real scenario. It would be a little bit pessimistic, so if we find this becomes design critical, we may want to revisit it. But if we're just checking a loading scenario and making sure it's safe, this is a good way to approach the problem. The other way to do it is to assume that the pressure distribution varies linear across the surface and design for this maximum value here. They tend to give actually very similar answers. And so these are the two ways, two alternative ways to look at eccentricity, which then brings me to the example problem I didn't have time to cover. So in your notes, you'll find this example problem.
we're saying what is the ultimate load that can be carried by a square footing shown below. So we're going to use shape factors. And by how much is the ultimate load reduced if the moment applied to the footing has the effect, I think I've got the word, word it should, has the effect of giving the applied load an eccentricity of 0.25 metres in one direction only. OK. So the first question we ask ourselves, is the general bearing capacity equation appropriate? Well, the answer is stiff clay is, as it implies, a stiff material. We're not going to suffer um, large compressions during loading. In fact, clays, when they're saturated and behaving undrained, don't change in volume at all because of the drainage, drainage conditions. And so we can say it's a uniform deposit of stiff clay. So it's uniform deposit of stiff clay. And therefore, Everything's okay there. Okay, having done that, we've justified using the bearing capacity equation. Therefore, we need to work out values of NC, NQ, and N gamma. And we know for an undrained analysis that NC equals, well, it's 2 plus pi, isn't it? So it's 5.14 NQ equals 1, n gamma equals 0. And because I do enough undrained analysis to know these by heart, but if you don't, you go to the data table or go to the data sheet. Well, you either go to your handout from the lecture if you're working with your notes, or when you get to the exam, you go to the data sheet at the back, and there is a table of bearing capacity factors. So you just look them up there. And if you look up in the table, you'll get 5 in a bit. It's not 5.14, you'll get 5.1 if you scale it off. And actually, that's accurate enough for geotechnical purposes. Right, the shape factors. Well, we need to look them up. And because we're recapping a problem at the start of the next lecture, I haven't brought my table of shape factors along. But if you look at the last handout, if you've got, well, it's the current handout, but you look to the last lecture, you'll find there's a table for working out shape factors. And when I worked them out, I got SC equals 1.2 for square footing. I got SQ equals 1. And I got S gamma equals 0.7. So that comes from the table on your handout, which we looked at in your in the last lecture, and they are the values which are compliant with the UK Annex to the Eurocode. And I mention that because, historically, the different people have published different shape factors, and they all tell much the same story, but are slightly different in the detail. And so, these are the values we now use, but in the past, we might have used 1.3 there, 1 and 0.8 there was a typical value. Very similar when you come to look at it from a geotechnical point of view. OK, so that gives us, over the page, this equation here. And the reason I mention the old shape factors is I have a feeling on your handouts I might still have the old shape factor in at that point there. So just double check. If it says 0.8, I think that was the Brinch-Hansen shape factors I was using there. But if 